do we have an adapter for USB Type C by any chance? Because how we're going to use the click curve if we don't have the adapter? But but, but maybe so, Christine, you're going for the clicker, right? Thank you. So yeah, I had my own clicker, but I forgot it in the room. So I usually carry my own clicker. And this time, yeah, I forgot it. And I guess you are presenting first, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And also to the Cambridge Longevity Society. That would be fantastic, yeah. <laughs> and we can maybe wait for a few minutes if you like. Yeah, I'm sorry, you were talk, uh, saying uh, about uh, your targets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The elegance or Drosophila, right? Yeah, yeah. All right. Cool. Are you in this chat group uh, on WeChat? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And have you been to this uh, Aging Biomarker Consortium uh, meeting that they had in China or not? I was there too, but yeah. I that was one crazy. Uh, one point six thousand scientists on aging. Yeah. 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 That was pretty cool. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think. Yeah. I think I'll uh, I'll introduce Alex. Um, okay, guys. Uh, I think Alex needs very little introduction. But in case uh, in case you don't know, Alex actually uh, left a successful career in in IT uh, to do aging research around uh, two years ago. He uh, founded in Silicon Medicine, which is using artificial intelligence to drastically decrease the uh, cost of target identification and validation. Um, but um, you may also be aware of the annual aging uh, research and drug discovery meeting. And um, these are the, the flyers that have been handed out. And as far as I'm aware, it's the biggest aging uh, conference slash meetup um, and it's happening in Copenhagen, end of August. So um, but yes, it's an absolute honor for Alex to visit us today in Cambridge, um, flying halfway across the world. But um, yeah, Alex, the, the stage is all yours. Of course, you don't want to introduce the Cambridge Longevity Society, right? Or but you have some I'm sure you guys are aware that this is the Cambridge Longevity Society, and um, we, we hold events uh, every, every month. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll turn it Okay, I'll uh, use my own laptop then. Um, so thank you very much for coming, everybody. So by sheer chance, I happen to be uh, also here, and um, uh, I was presenting at the LSX uh, Leaders Conference uh, this week uh, in London. It turned out to be a much better event than I expected. So if you are um, going to attend a really nice industry partnering event in London, go there next year, very, very cool, uh, 1.6 thousand people. Uh, and um, uh, very happy to be here. Uh, and uh, how many of you um, know in silicon medicine? All right, great. So, but many of you don't. So it's good that uh, we have a lot of people who don't know us, and that's what we actually want to, um, uh, want to, have happened to um, introduce more people to the ideas in uh, longevity and uh, utilizing artificial intelligence for longevity research and uh, ensuring that there are more international collaborations uh, in this field. So I myself, uh, uh, as already pre uh, presented, uh, decided to leave a pretty successful career in IT about 20 years ago and uh, go into biotech and specifically into longevity biotech because I don't think there is anything more important than uh, aging uh, and longevity because uh, this disease is going to kill all of us. Uh, regardless of how hard we try to escape, at some point in time it's gonna happen, right? We are mentally prepared for that, but ideally we shouldn't be, um, uh, we shouldn't be uh, losing too much uh, as we uh, as we age, and that's kind of my objective to ensure that we can 
uh, stay uh, young uh, for as long as possible. So death will find us all, but uh, we shouldn't be losing, right? Um, and uh, also aging is the source of many diseases. Uh, and uh, I think it's also the most altruistic uh, thing to pursue because one um, drug that can increase the lifespan of uh, uh, everybody in the, on the planet for one year uh, generates uh, 8 billion life years. So even if you are a great surgeon, if you are a good scientist, or if you're a good uh, medical doctor, you won't be able to save that many lives and generate so many life years. So if you decide to pursue a career in aging research and stumble upon something that can increase uh, everybody's life by just one year, you may be the most impactful person on the planet. Um, so that's why I encourage everybody to go there. Uh, another thing is that uh, this industry is growing in immensely uh, over the past, has grown immensely over the past uh, few years. And uh, we've seen hundreds of new companies for being formed. We've seen many, many venture capital companies um, uh, raise a lot of money to go into this field. However, so far we have not seen any commercial successes. And in my 20 years in the field, uh, and you know, running also the ARDD conference, uh, we saw many new companies come into this world and then die. So I saw companies like Unity Biotechnology, right? Wonderful company going after Synalytics, uh, raise a lot of money, make a lot of noise, uh, and then list publicly on the on stock exchange, uh, go to a billion dollars, and then flop in phase two, actually flop in two phase twos, uh, and uh, decline to uh, you know subprime levels. We're talking about uh, you know a few uh, um, tens of millions of dollars, right? So investors lost a lot of money. Right now, of course, they demonstrated some uh, efficacy in phase two in uh, um, DEMA. Uh, and but fa failed in AMD and arthritis of the knee, uh, and it shows you that you know drug discovery is and drug development is an extremely risky field. Another example is RestorBio. Many of you have heard about John Manick, who tried to repurpose a TOR inhibitor from Novartis uh, to go after um, immune potentiation, a vaccine potentiation um, uh, with a TOR inhibitor. Uh, and uh, took it out of Novartis, uh, listed the company on a stock exchange, took it almost to a billion dollars, and guess what? Flopped in phase three. So we haven't seen any commercial success in this field, and the reason I'm talking about this right now is that regardless of how much money you raise, it will not be enough. So very often people are saying that, you know, let's put five billion dollars into this company, and it's gonna solve aging. Or let's, well, let's, let's raise $5 billion and we are gonna, you know, I'm gonna produce anti-aging drugs. Well, no. Uh, you need to learn drug discovery to understand that $5 billion in our field is actually not a lot. Um, because uh, last year the FDA approved 50 drugs. Uh, in my mind, about seven of them were more directly innovative it took many companies uh, decades to develop those 50 drugs. Uh, and um, the industry spends approximately $200 billion a year on research over time to get to those 50 drug approvals. So it's a very, very risky game. And the average cost of uh, discovery and development of a new therapeutic is approximately $2 billion, 90% failure rate. In longevity, it should be even worse. So that's why whatever you do, you need to think about how to develop a sustainable business model in drug discovery and credible business model to ensure that you can sustain those failures and also formulate your careers so that if you fail, you can rise as a phoenix again because there will be a lot of, uh, a lot of failures, right? So that's what I was trying to do. And that's why we decided to go after AI to build uh, uh, in silico and started building it as a company that is not focused only on aging, but is focused on drug discovery broadly. And I'm gonna introduce you a little bit to the company and to the field, and then go and explain how I see the most credible pathways in this field 
where you can make a career in aging research, where you can contribute uh, meaningfully to the field, where you might be able to discover longevity boosting therapeutics, but at the same time, you might be able to make uh, some money for your investors uh, and you know, not degrade your career in just one field, even though sometimes it, it happens and it will happen. So um, how many of you are in chemistry here? All right, so how many of you know about generative chemistry? All right, how many of you read my papers in generative chemistry? <laughs> okay, great. So um, uh, we started our pathway in generative chemistry a long time ago. So some of the first papers um, uh, in generative chemistry were published in 2016 by my group. Uh, it's called the Cornucopia of Meaningful Leaves. So here you see um, the timeline of, oh, I've got a nice pointer. So uh, here you see the timeline of uh, AI. Uh, here you see the GANs in, uh, so, so sorry, timeline of GANs in general. So 2014, the uh, GANs were published. Uh, and the first uh, GAN for um, generative deferral network for small molecule drug des design in oncology was published by our team. And uh, now a lot of people don't cite it, but it happened. Uh, and uh, that's this one, the cornucopia of meaningful leaves. Uh, and then we spent a lot of uh, time in theory, and then in 2017 we did a cool experiment, entangled conditional autoencoder for de novo drug design. We designed the selective JAK3 inhibitor and published, uh, published in 2018. But uh, one of the investors who invested in us, they actually saw this experimental data right from their lab because they are they're a big chemistry CRO, contract research organization, uh, and they actually made us happen at that time. I had like one more round of synthesis left and after that the company would die. And then with that company uh, called Wuxi Aptech, uh, the biggest contract research organization in chemistry in the world, um, with th tens of thousands of uh, synthetic chemists, uh, w they challenged us to design a small molecule um, drug for a very well-known target in fibrosis called DDR1 kinase. And in 46 days, we designed uh, um, the molecules that were tested in mice. So that was a pretty cool paper called Generative Sensorial Reinforcement Learning System. So we were generative before <laughs> generative became popular. And in 2018, we also got into generative uh, biology, generating uh, biological data sets with the desired properties and also uh, using different types of uh, uh, chemical matter to induce certain transcriptional changes and also transcriptional uh, profiles um, in a variety of cell lines and uh, also in uh, um, live tissue. So also collaborated very actively with Alana Spurogudzic. How many of you know Alan? Great, so yeah, he just got $200 million to go after automated drug discovery. So um, we published many papers with Alan and we collaborate quite closely that he is a true genius, but uh, he is mostly in generative chemistry. We actually started in generative biology a long, long time ago. So some disclaimers, don't buy anything on, based on what I say, and you, by the way, you can't, you, can't, you can't buy our stock at this point in time. Uh, but this is in silico now, so we have eight regional R&D sites. Uh, we are very heavily focused on Asia, uh, and I'll explain why. Uh, so our, we have two regional headquarters, one is in New York, another one is in Hong Kong. Uh, in China, and uh, um, we have the theoretical research uh, center in Montreal. I'm Canadian by citizenship, um, but left Canada a long time ago. Uh, but that's where a lot of AI theory happens. So you probably have heard Yosha Benjo, Mila, and Alan now is at the University of Toronto. Uh, we also have a site in the UAE, very unusual location for a company to be based, but I highly encourage you to explore Abu Dhabi. Um, because first of all, it's zero tax. Unless you are an American citizen or some other uh, citizen of a country which chases you for tax, even if you live in Iran, um, uh, this is a really cool place to be. Again, zero uh, personal income tax. And as a matter of fact, if you are a high profile scientist, you will get negative income tax. So part of your local salary will be reimbursed back to the company. You can make a deal with the, with the, with the government. But the real reason why we are there is because Russia invaded Ukraine. 
terrible thing, right? Dramatic. But uh, at the same time, we managed to hire quite a bit of uh, what we call AI refugees from both sides of the border. So they don't need to fight here. They can coexist very peacefully uh, and um, uh, do great research uh, for the benefit of humanity. So we moved uh, approximately 50 people uh, from Russia and Ukraine to uh, the UAE. Uh, and they have a Ministry of AI, advanced infrastructure. And by the way, whatever you've heard about the restrictions there, you are living in um, a very restricted place right now. <laughs> there, everything is open. You don't need to you know, wear uh, any specific clothing, complete freedom of speech. Uh, you can buy alcohol, whatever you like. Um, and a great friend of Israel, by the way. Uh, my office is in um, <coughs> the former embassy of Israel right now. So great doors, huge, heavy doors um, that you don't need because it's super safe. Nobody can actually you know, mug you on the street because everything is monitored very well, just like in China. So one of the reasons why we're, we're in China and we're in every part of China, we're in Taipei and Hong Kong and Shanghai and Suzhou, um, is because if you haven't seen what happened to the IT industry, uh, where Apple does not manufacture its own computers. Um, the same happened in biotech. And if you are smart right now, you might actually still ride this wave of contract research. Uh, so China invested over, its, in my estimates, over half a trillion dollars um, into um, biomedical infrastructure over the past 20 years. So that is a huge amount. And we've got a huge number of CROs, contract research organizations, that can do experiments for you. So if you're synthesizing chemistry, that's the place to go. Uh, if you're doing some enzymatic assays or uh, very early preclinical assays, um, that's the place to go. Hundreds of thousands of uh, scientists available for hire within labs uh, with infrastructure that are, sec that are second to none. So Wuxi Aptek employs, I think, 30,000 chemists, right? And you can hire a bunch of them uh, to work for you to synthesize chemistry. And right now, everything there is also robotic. I'm gonna show you a few videos. Uh, in my opinion, China is, has already taken over in many fields. And uh, if you are an AI-powered drug discovery company, it's great to be an operating system on top of many of those CROs controlling them. And your competitive advantage can come from being there locally to supervise those full-time equivalents, FTEs, within those CROs. So they, uh, first of all, you get the best ones. Some of them, you know, have uh, their hands growing out of their back and they don't really cook chemistry really well, right? So you need to get the best ones. Uh, and you need to ensure that you distribute the workload so that you don't get any IP issues, right? Because sometimes it's uh, people who centralize in one CRO, it's not great. Um, also, it's a great hub for talent in drug discovery. So a lot of people from big pharmaceutical companies went back. So, you know, 10 years ago, many top labs within pharma and also top US institutions, you would see a lot of great, uh, you know, elderly, um, uh, European or you know Ashkenazi scientists uh, teaching a lot of great Chinese scientists, and now many of them went back and uh, created companies, and many of those companies have already exited on the stock market, and these guys made a lot of money, so they are not going to go back, and they are not going to go back to poverty either, and they became investors and they started biotechs. So and some of them already listed those biotechs one more time and it created a vibrant uh, biotech community that is, again, second to none. And whatever you hear in the media currently, you know, um, the Western media is very against China. I hope it's gonna pass, especially in science. We need to be collaborating regardless of, you know, what people uh, think. Um, and uh, that's why we decided to move our headquarters to Hong Kong to be closer to those CROs and to be, um, uh, to also take a little bit of a part in this massive explosion of biotech in, in China. It's a Cambrian explosion, and it's real, the future. So these people are not going to go back. They can only go forward. 
Um, I am one of the biggest optimists uh, when it comes to China. And you know, once it was said that never bet against the US economy, never bet against the Chinese economy, and also never bet against the Chinese science, because they, those guys uh, produce now 30% of the best papers in the world. Um, and in Hong Kong, we decided to uh, set up a target discovery center. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. In Shanghai, we have drug discovery center, and in Suzhou, I have a robotics lab, and in Taipei, quantum computing. So also, if you are conservative about the future of quantum computing, don't. I actually think next uh, five years, you are going to have something very similar happen to quantum as you've seen with GPT, right? So chat GPT is now popular, and those large language models are extremely uh, famous. Why? Because it got consumerized. Right, so everybody has access to it. By the way, GPT-3 was published uh, in summer of 2020, so it has been out for a long time. So something similar happened with quantum, and many hyperscalers are now building their quantum computing infrastructure, so we should be able to see a lot of qubits available in the next five years. Again, that's my personal bet, but um, this year you should be able to see some interesting results from my lab, so follow, uh, follow the papers. So we have, um, so one interesting thing about uh, in silico is that our mission is to extend healthy productive longevity for everyone. And in pharma, it's not a very popular thing to say. <laughs> so if you say that you're focused on aging, many pharma companies will just not work with you, especially if you make all kinds of uh, extraordinary uh, statements, right? So try not to do that. I made a lot of those mistakes early on and now I'm heavily paying for those. So um, I had to basically reinvent our brand image to be more pharma friendly. And that's why we have this conference in Copenhagen where we bring together top scientists, top academics, and uh, top industry leaders um, from pharma to interact and explain that there are many targets that overlap in aging and disease. That's something that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and uh, um, we decided that you know, we are gonna set our bar very high, but it will allow us to build the infrastructure required to get there. So for Elon, for example, wants to go to Mars, right? Maybe even further. But to get there, we need to get uh, you know, satellites, we need to get uh, to the orbit, uh, and we need to get to the moon and ensure that we build a successful industry. So same needs to happen in aging. And for that, we decided that, okay, we're gonna focus on our values, so technology changes very quickly. By the time our program one completes phase two, um, we will already see a lot of uh, technological change that will make a lot of discovery uh, techniques that we use to discover that molecule obsolete. So we decided to fo focus on values and our core values is patient first. So whatever we do, we want to get the drugs to the patients as quickly as possible and also as effective as possible. And doesn't even matter if it's aging or not, but of course, we're looking for dual purpose therapeutics. Uh, relentless innovation. So very often, once you go clinical, or once you get closer to the clinic, you forget about AI. So there is no more AI. You don't need it. Uh, you need it a little bit for discovery. Uh, and you, you most of the time focus on administrative work, working with the regulators and running clinical trials. And the pace there is much slower than in tech. So, but we decided to uh, become relentless in innovation and transparency and integrity. So that's why we publish approximately two research papers every month, uh, lots of patents and uh, uh, in good journals, uh, trying to go in good journals. Uh, and we also, uh, for program one, um, I'm gonna talk about that, we're also shooting a documentary video. So for the past three years, even when this really goes down, we still shoot. So when the experiments don't work, we shoot. So hopefully we'll be able to release that video um, after phase two is complete, regardless of how it goes. Uh, and we're also are running a docuthon, documentary hackathon for documentary filmmakers to participate and uh, tell this drug discovery story. So we have a platform consisting of three elements, Panda Omics, Chemistry32, and Clinico. Uh, so we sell software. Currently 10 out of the top 20 pharmaceutical companies have deployed my software after we launched in 2020. So it's pretty fast, uh, generates quite a bit of revenue, but software without your own pipeline is nothing because pharma doesn't believe you 
if you don't have your own therapeutic pipeline. It's very important to demonstrate that you can derive a valuable therapeutic out of your software. And we decided in 2019 to develop our own pipeline. Currently, we have 37 programs. So that's a lot. And some are already in human clinical trials. There are very few companies that have achieved that. So just uh, wanted to kind of, uh, bef before I proceed to company introduction and uh, science, wanted to advertise this conference. This one is currently the largest one in the world on aging. If you're interested in aging, please go there. It's very cheap, uh, organized by uh, the University of Copenhagen. I founded it orig originally in uh, the city of Basel in Switzerland, but in 2019 we moved to Copenhagen and even during COVID it stayed open. So it's pretty epic, I uh, highly recommend it, five day event. Uh, lots of people participate uh, online as well. And we've got uh, Boston Consulting Group as a knowledge partner, so they usually uh, bring a lot of credibility to the field and produce great reports. So a little bit about the company. Uh, so founded in 2014, this is a little bit older slide, now we have about 330 people already. Um, and we had pretty substantial revenue growth last year, so it's tens of millions, uh, because the industry has consolidated. So when we started, there were hundreds of companies, now, you know, three, four at the top, uh, and we are definitely, you know, by far, well, in my opinion, uh, number one in China. Uh, and I even don't speak Chinese. Uh, and uh, we, um, I'll explain why, uh, but we were pretty gladiatorial with another company which uh, just exited drug discovery and became a conscious research organization. Um, and uh, yeah, pretty well known. We raised over $400 million. So from mostly biotechnology investors, so investors don't see us as an AI company at all. Um, we went through several stages. So originally we started as an algorithm company, designing algorithms, and that, that time nobody was talking about generative AI. It's diff difficult to raise. You show the paper that I was talking about, the cornucopia of meaningful leads, and say, look, we, are, we can use this algorithm to add an additional petal to the flower. And look, I just did it with molecules. Nobody believed that, and medicinal chemists always wanted to see the experimental result. They don't, didn't care about the algorithm. So sometimes I was locked out of conferences um, uh, after talks, right? And then we started our software era. So we got 37 million round B. Uh, a lot of uh, 12 uh, pharmaceutical uh, companies invested and uh, we grew, launched uh, Pandaomics Chemistry 32 at the time. And then we raised additional um, over $350 million and became a biotech. So very rapidly we started developing our own products. And right now, uh, we also built a robotics lab to accelerate that. So we have two CEOs. Uh, myself, uh, I'm responsible um, for innovation and uh, artificial intelligence predominantly. Uh, and Dr. Ren Feng, who joined me in 2019, well, who we first met in 2019, who joined me officially 2021 in the beginning of the year. But uh, PhD from Harvard, 11 years at GlaxoSmithKline, and then, uh, um, he listed a company called Medicilin. It's a huge CRO, uh, one of the top uh, uh, contract research organizations. So thousands of people reported to him. And he took it to $8 billion in the market. And then he saw, we started synthesizing at Medicilin. And then he realized what our generative chemistry can do and decided to join us originally as chief science officer. Uh, and um, then he was, uh, we, we, we made him C CEO after he nominated several preclinical candidates. Uh, so that was pretty cool. And again, we sit on top of more than 40 contract research organizations. Uh, and for uh, every contract research organization, we usually have dedicated uh, CRO management. So we try to ensure that we have our own people uh, in the labs uh, supervising synthesis and testing. So in terms of allocation of resources, um, uh, by the way, I, we cannot make this one screen, I guess, right? Um, but if we can, if, 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 we, if you know how to do it, let's do it. If not, let's just continue like this. Does it disturb you guys or is it okay to have two screens? Okay, let's have two screens. Um, or you know how to do it. Yeah, let's do one screen. Because... No, 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 it's just, aha, uh -huh. oh, okay. See, you guys are advanced. But then you have just one screen, okay. But can I scratch it or... Oh, no, no, no. Is it better? Well, let's do it like this, okay? Um, 
ju 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 just in case. I can, can we actually put it there? Then I can stand here. Sorry. Um, I, I thought that I figured it out. No, no? Uh -huh. Okay, great. So then I can stand here and uh, you will see this part. Um, so now the allocation of company resources, pretty important, is I take care of about 20% of the company money and uh, about 10% is going into AI and now 8% is going into uh, robotics and reagents, but most of the uh, work is done at the preclinical side and uh, clinical development. So Dr. Ren is responsible for most of the budget uh, and we have to um, do this because actually AI started paying for itself because you started selling the software and it brings the revenue in. Um, and also it's very constantly improving based on user feedback. So every time a great medicinal chemist uses this uh, tool, we improve the algorithm, um, especially if the feedback is negative and very often it's negative. Um, but we use this tool internally to um, do a lot of preclinical development. So you probably are all familiar with this chart, right? So this is how drugs are discovered. This, is, this comes from Steve Paul's paper. If you haven't read it, please do. 2010 paper, but it's still uh, epic and seminal in the field. How to improve R&D productivity, make sure you use drug discovery. Uh, and in that paper, he talks uh, about uh, how much it takes, uh, how, how, how much it costs to discover a drug when you already know the target. So target to hit, hit to lead, lead optimization, then you do preclinical experiments, then you get into phase one, you test, uh, test uh, safety, in phase two you test efficacy, in phase three you test both, and then you submit and launch. So this entire process costed in 2010 around 1.8 billion. Since then it only increased. So in pharma we have uh, the opposite of Moore's law, it's called Elroom's law. Uh, and here you've got the probability of success at each stage. Uh, here are the number of years it takes and here cost per launch in millions. So that's why I'm saying regardless of how much money you raise, it's not gonna be enough. Uh, and in that paper, he forgot about target discovery, right? And uh, target discovery, that's the real hardcore, right? So that's what you do at Cambridge here most of the time, right? So you're going up to something more novel and there the probability of success is 90, uh, so one to one, uh, uh, five to one percent, right? So one to five percent. Um, 95 to 99% probability of failure here. And it can take you decades, right, and cost you billions of dollars. So Christine here in uh, uh, at Cambridge, so raise your hand, so she works on protein separation, um, uh, and has really cool uh, papers uh, coming up. Uh, but they are trying to find new targets for Alzheimer's and other neurological diseases, and very rare, so right now we don't have a good target for Alzheimer's, right, so after, decades of research and uh, every time you want to test it fails on the preclinical level very often but if it progresses it fails well in neuro almost 100 percent with the exception of recent uh, uh, approvals um, but if you start if you talk about cancer still you've got a lot of failures in phase two right because and most of the time uh, the 66 percent failure rate in phase two is because of the poor choice of the target. So target ID is extremely difficult. And if you are talking about aging, you should expect more failures, not less. Because uh, you first need to approve it as a drug and then implicate it in aging because, well, for, you need to have a commercially tractable business model, right? So this is very important. So uh, at Ancilica over the last uh, uh, three and a half years, we managed to go from here to here with one of our programs, novel target, novel molecule uh, out of generative AI. And we have completed phase one going to phase two right now with an anti-fibrotic molecule. So to my knowledge, it's the only one uh, in the world like this, um, but I'm pretty sure there will be more. Uh, and we have an entire portfolio of drugs. And now uh, some we're starting from no new uh, known targets, some from novel targets. So novelty is the in the eye of the beholder, right? So how do you measure novelty? If it's mentioned in the literature, is it novel uh, or not? So usually novel, it means that uh, um, it has never been tested on the human clinical trials anywhere or in animal models. Um, 
So we have three platforms. One is called Panda Onyx. It's used by uh, hundreds of key opinion leaders globally who know how to discover targets. It incorporates approximately 60 target discovery philosophies from every pharmaceutical company that we ever collaborated with. You probably are aware of uh, GSK Open Targets. Uh, how many of you all use Open Targets? Okay, great. So Open Targets gives you two scores or three scores, right? Uh, um, this one gives you uh, more than 60 scores. And uh, just for Onyx, 21 models, deep learning models, and also interpretation and lots of tests. Um, so this one has uh, many papers being uh, prepared uh, right now. Even we, last week we published with high school students. So three high school students uh, were first authors. That was super cool. And uh, that was super international. One was from the UK, another one was from the US, and the third one was from China. So the way it should be done. Um, uh, and they collaborated around pandemics uh, and uh, identified novel targets for glioblastoma and aging. So look up for our paper. Uh, Chemistry 32 is deployed on premise uh, or in the private cloud uh, at pharmaceutical companies. Uh, again, 10 out of the top 20 use, use it or used it in the past for the drug discovery pl platform uh, programs. And in clinical is a tool that we uh, cater with uh, to hedge funds and banks. Um, pharmaceutical companies don't like it. It's a predictor of phase two to phase three transition. So it basically <laughs> Uh, looks uh, about, we, we, we realize that only about 20% of the trials are more or less predictable using the data we have. But when we uh, do the prediction, the uh, accuracy is reasonably high. Uh, and currently a lot of hedge funds like it and pilot it. Um, when the small and medium time biotech fails in phase two, usually it tanks. If it succeeds, many, uh, you know, hundreds of percent uh, increase. So um, we are working on this project for eight years and we have a lot of prospective validation, haven't published a single peer-reviewed paper, uh, but we published a lot of uh, archive papers where we make those predictions, wait for a few years, and see how it did. So for, to do that, you really need to have a long-term vision. So Panda Onyx utilizes approximately, so five to 10 million uh, Onyx uh, samples, Onyx profiles are integrated in the system already, uh, depending on how it counts. Um, and we have many, many different uh, approaches to target discovery, many different scores uh, to process those samples uh, and uh, identify targets. And then we have, so that's where novelty comes from. And then we have approximately $2 trillion worth of text data incorporated in text. The reason I'm you're not using parameters but dollars is because we track government grants over the past 50 years. So every time a scientist gets a grant, we log it into the data set uh, and we link it to all the publications, uh, clinical trials, omics repositories, everything that is linked to this money. So you might, you have used uh, NIH reporter tool or CORDIS from uh, EU, uh, European Union. Uh, there are many other reporting tools. Uh, all this um, grant uh, giving is very transparent usually in most uh, countries. So we link this data together and uh, train models, uh, large language models predominantly on this data to give you ad additional confidence for targets that are being selected using omics. And then you process them using many different uh, approaches to see which ones are tractable, commercially tractable, uh, novel, uh, and most importantly, imp important in a specific disease. So there we have many papers. Um, started with one of those nature comes papers showing uh, just the pathway um, uh, dimensionality reduction algorithm called IPANDA in silico pathway activation network decomposition algorithm. Um, I was last author on this one uh, and it's purely algorithmic. Um, so no experimental data, no new data generated, just an algorithm. It's very similar to like GCEA uh, or SPIA or DART, uh, but a little bit more precise. And those algorithms allowed us to very rapidly get into deep learning on uh, biological data. So we, instead of uh, uh, training on um, individual genes, we started working on, uh, with pathway scores. So uh, this dimensionality reduction allowed us to work with limited data sets that were available for omics back then. Uh, and identified some novel targets very quickly using deep neural nets. Actually, out of this paper, a company called Ajax Therapeutics was formed, that was probably maybe like 40% of the IP that they had. 
um, and POC 71 was one of their targets. Uh, and they listed on NYC and went through all the way, I think, like $170 million. So uh, we earned very little from this collaboration because it was a service collaboration, but it was a really cool exercise where we trained deep neural networks to predict differentiation st state of the cells based on uh, expression data for the state of differentiation and identified the embryonic to fetal transition uh, uh, factors. And then we went into transformers, published a bunch of papers uh, as well. This is the history of deep learning. I, I think I uh, uh, tried to explain the slide before. By the way, how about I go over time, like half an hour? Is it okay or not? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is the history of deep learning. In 2014, we got uh, GANs published by Ian Goodfellow and Yosha Benjo at the University of Montreal, and he went to uh, Google and OpenAI. Uh, and um, we picked up on this paper. Uh, there's basically two deep neural networks competing with each other. You're all familiar with GANs. Um, and we decided to use this technology to generate small molecules with the desired properties. Uh, so that was uh, my first paper, um, then the first experimental validation, and then this big nature biotech paper. Uh, even though it probably wasn't as impressive as the entangled connection out on Twitter, um, but the generative uh, tensorial reinforcement learning system is also pretty cool. So I'll read this paper. Um, and that allowed us to build the foundation for our chemistry software called Chemistry 32. There we have 42 generative engines. Uh, so some are transformers, some are GANs, some are variational out on Twitter to reinforcement learning, uh, some are genetic algorithms. So we basically, it's a fair game for all of them. In order for one of those algorithms to be included in the system, it has to be experimentally validated. Usually it's about uh, 200,000 to $600,000, as we estimate, per one. And that's why we very often work with partners to do this validation. And sometimes we publish papers around them, but uh, we usually use more advanced algorithms internally. But the real secret sauce is the reward pipeline. So here we have more than 500 predictive algorithms that predict just one feature in a molecule uh, or two features, or, or sometimes several features. And uh, sometimes uh, um, you would look at uh, binding at in 3D very quickly. Uh, and every time uh, the molecule gets uh, generated, it gets evaluated by this reward pipeline. Uh, and the model that generated this uh, molecule is either rewarded or punished, depending on the quality of the molecule. So uh, unlike chat GPT, we don't need snappy response, right? Because uh, ahead of you, you've got several months or years of validation. So it's better to uh, keep this system cooking, right? And reinforcing. So all of those are pre-trained. We can give it either a crystal um, or an alpha flow model. We just kind of published a paper on that. Um, uh, or a ligand, or both, and this guy start generating and uh, um, uh, being reinforced with a reward pipeline. Uh, and then you generate maybe 15, 20 molecules synthesized, and uh, depending on the target uh, class uh, and the target type, it will work. So uh, we have, uh, for kinases, the hit rate is like 90%. So our program one, which uh, is right now in uh, phase two cl clinical trial, we synthesized only 79 molecules for the program. So usually we synthesize now about 70 molecules per program. Also a bunch of papers published. And um, in Clinico, uh, I'll actually skip this one, but uh, we started with more than 30 different scores in 2016 and narrowed down to just three scores. One score is target choice, how implicated the target is in the disease how heterogeneous the target is in the uh, patient subpopulation. And we have a large language model which predicts the uh, outcome based on clinical study design. So you actually look at the clinical study design, even uh, uh, early stage, uh, and try to predict whether it's gonna succeed or not. So when those three scores are aligned, the accuracy of the prediction is very high. So currently it's 89 to 92%. Uh, prospectively. So we have prospective, retrospective, and quasi-prospective validation, right? Uh, so that's a pretty cool exercise, but um, I can talk for hours about this tool. So we are pretty commercially viable. So last year we did pretty cool deals. Uh, my favorite one is Fosun Pharma, where we are implicated a target called QPCTL. Uh, it's a target within the CD47 pathway. 
uh, within the Golgi complex, they implicated an, in an oncology. So one other company is planning to take it into Alzheimer's, uh, but we thought, okay, well, it's an immuno-oncology target, uh, demonstrated efficacy in two experimental models, showed it to a bunch of farmers. We uh, got a um, kind of a competition for this target, so everybody wanted it. Uh, Fosun gave us 13 million upfront. We also retained 50% uh, in the molecule uh, as joint uh, co-development, and right now it's going phase one. So can you imagine how quickly it is, right? So that's the best way to partner with pharma, approximately at lead or candidate stage, because then they will have a lot of say in clinical study design, and usually they know how to do it better. By the way, I think this target is also implicated in aging, in immune suppressor. Um, that's why we chose it. Uh, and then Sanofi does a templated deal, right? So they give you a bunch of targets, you process them, and then uh, whatever gets selected, uh, you can take it all over to the preclinical candidates, you get some upfront, and uh, you've got some milestones, and you've got some uh, royalties. So just FYI, that's how uh, big deals are made in pharma. Um, so now let's switch gears to aging. I just explained what Ancilico does. So a lot of enabling technologies to very rapidly prosecute targets. So actually I'm not a big fan of pharmacological approaches in aging because nothing works better than rapamycin so far, right? So um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the problem, right? So <clears throat> you grow older and you realize that, okay, 20 years ago, well, 18 years ago, somebody implicated rapamycin in aging and back then, every uh, aging conference, everybody is talking about metformin, rapamycin, and today, still, you come to a conference, everybody's talking metformin, rapamycin, and rapamycin still gives you the biggest torque for your buck, right? It might actually work much better in humans than it works in mice, so uh, I cannot confirm or deny if I take it or not, um, but a bunch of people do. Uh, and. Um, but rapamycin is a very good example of how pharmacolo pharmacology can be used for aging research, right? Um, and the idea is to beat rapamycin. And rapamycin is a drug which is purposed towards a bunch of diseases and actually very commercially tractable. Right now we just see that TOR as a target is demonetized because when everybody was racing for TOR inhibitors, they developed like huge numbers of PI3K TOR inhibitors, right? So lots of libraries available and pick it and you know, run, but it's usually gonna be patented by somebody else or it's already off patent. So the only thing you've got is uh, you know, method of use. Um, but many targets are not demonetized, right? And you want to find those targets that are reasonably novel, implicated in aging uh, and commercially tractable uh, and also not necessarily that difficult, right? So that's the idea for that, that I came up with. A lot of uh, people at conferences on aging are talking about, well, is aging a disease? I even published a couple papers on that, right? At the end of the day, when it comes to pharma, it doesn't matter. You, we should not even think about it. philosophically, overpopulation, disease or not. Who cares? If you are developing drugs, you should not care about that. If the drug works on aging, it should work in a variety of diseases. Find one. Purpose it, take a, do a clinical trial, uh, try to do an aging clock at the same time, and try to figure the most uh, commercially viable way to make it work, and also do in parallel a kind of undercover aging clinical trial, because many of those clinical trials, even phase one, they do allow you to run biomarkers, at least on blood-based biomarkers. And you probably, how many of you saw, have seen aging AI before? So that was one of the aging clocks that they published in 2016 based on re re really basic blood biochemistry that you would get from your GP or in a clinical trial you would get those markers anyway. So you can see if even on that level the, um, the drug is working or not, you will get this data. If you wanna go more hardcore, you would look at some allogic protein arrays. Many pharma companies use that anyway for clinical trials and see if the drug is reversing the aging clock or not and which one. So we are looking at targets that are common in aging and disease and are important in aging and disease, dual purpose targets. So uh, you would be looking at a bunch of uh, diseases that are age related and non-age related and uh, using aging clocks as tools to discover targets uh, to see if you can interpret those aging clocks and find uh, in those um, histograms of importance, feature importance, 
some interesting targets that might overlap with diseases. So that's what we do. We published a fun paper um, which year, last year, um, to, 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 to today, still 2023, okay. Uh, so on uh, identifying dual purpose um, targets in aging and disease, uh, that was our first paper out of Hong Kong, a target discovery group. Uh, and there we used Panda Onyx to process a bunch of uh, uh, profiles, uh, transcriptomic and methylation profiles from age-associated diseases, non-age-associated diseases, and also healthy people, uh, and found those dual purpose targets um, rank them by novelty, so this is usually novelty um, output of Pandonix. These are, so usually the main output of Pandonix is, I can actually show you a, a demo if you like, to the software product. So you've got a list of genes. Uh, here you've got the scores coming from Onyx. So different philosophies, some pharma companies like, you know, key near nearest neighbors approach, some like to have genomically valid targets. So here we would look at those kind of philosophies and then multiple different text data, set, the data types, right? Uh, and even financial scores. So is this, uh, has any biotechs ever taken this gene uh, into uh, uh, clinical trials, right? Or published it in any of the stock reports. And then we even evaluate the credibility of the key opinion leaders doing a study. That's the most fun scores. Can you trust the guy who did, or, or gal who did the work? Um, and here we've got accessibility by small molecules, accessibility by biologics, uh, and uh, drugability, uh, and uh, uh, safety, and also novelty. You can actually, uh, when you are presenting target lists to your PI or to anybody, uh, to your professor, for example, you want to start with low novelty. Because if you go high novelty, they will not trust you anymore. So first you want to show them something that they already seen it before, and then they say, oh, but I know this one, it's been tested, blah, blah, blah. They're great, so now just decrease the novelty component and you know, look at where your risk profile is, right? So if you are a risk taker, go high novelty, right? And high and uh, low drugability, go ahead. CMIX, great target. Um, so then we basically uh, processed this using Panda Onyx and created the target wheel where we took a bunch of targets and uh, that we found overlapping in aging and disease and we structured them by uh, confidence, drugability, and implication of different uh, hallmarks of aging. So if you are a VC wanting to build a biotech around aging, get uh, you know, your team into um, an archery range, turn it into an archery target, and you know, start uh, shooting at the targets, right? Great way to pick the targets, by the way. Uh, we, we do that for all of our offsites. Either we do paintball with this, or we do darts. I have a darts board in the office. Uh, or we actually go and do archery, right? Seriously, we call it target practice. Great team activity. And then uh, if you hit some targets, you need to come and interpret it. So that's the most fun exercise. Uh, and especially for novices, it's like, oh, I don't know PPP3. Okay, how did you end up at Ancilica? Oh, I am an AI scientist. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, then you uh, um, then you chat around the uh, target board, and you can do those kind of exercises. Um, but we've done this, right? We will do it many times over because now we see that um, some of those targets uh, we have tested and they do not work as well as we expected, and we try to validate this approach with many many collaborations. So here is one collaboration I can talk about. Uh, you can find it at www.als.ai. Uh, we collaborated with really cool um, set of collaborators internationally. Um, started this collaboration approximately February, March last year. I went to a Hopkins conference in ALS uh, run by Jeffrey Rushstein and Mary Tutsevich. So she's the head of neurology at Harvard MGH, chair of neurology, and Jeffrey is her counterpart at Hopkins, uh, so my alma mater. And, um, uh, Lu Bai is the very famous neuroscientist in uh, China, Tsinghua University, and Zhangke is former Jeffrey Rothstein's um, postdoc uh, who ended up as a professor at Mayo who developed a really cool model of ALS in flies. What? Yeah. So, um, I mean, for ALS, the best model to test uh, ALS drugs, what is the best model to test ALS drugs, guys? 
No. Humans, yes. <laughs> so that's the only model that you can trust, right? And there are very few of them with ALS. And usually they are quite old and only taking something, right? So um, the be next best, best thing would be uh, some organism, right? So and flies are just good enough. There are multiple mouse models on ALS, but they are not, to, according to our studies, that are not exactly great matches with human ALS. So if you do just basic transcriptional profile on the entire transcriptome, <coughs> very different. Um, and these guys are also different, but <laughs> that's sometimes all we've got. Uh, the rest that would be organoids developed using iPSCs, and iPSCs are baby cells. They have lost their methylation profile. They have lost the protein damage, right? So you've got, uh, uh, I don't trust, I, I work a lot with iPSCs and with organoids myself because I built one of the really cool labs I'm gonna talk about. But um, uh, there we use a lot of organoids. Right now we've got a, a, a really cool experiment running with organoids. But um, uh, here, uh, we, we I, I don't like testing stuff on uh, just iPSC derived stuff. Uh, so an animal model is always better. So here we got a huge uh, ALS data repository from um, uh, Answer ALS Consortium run by Harvard and Hopkins and many others. Uh, so it's thousands of uh, patient uh, s uh, cells reprogrammed into neurons through iPSC and you can actually use the data. There have been profiles of that met uh, methylation and transcriptomic and many other and also phenotyping. Uh, and we've got a bunch from um, uh, from real human patients in Funda Onyx already. Uh, and we realized that they are not exactly very compatible. <laughs> uh, so Jeffrey Washtai, an amazing scientist, you know, if you ever get to work with him, please do spend your time because that's like a treasure trove of uh, knowledge. It's like chat GPT um, without constraints. So he might be using some strong words like S word, for example, when it comes to targets. Um, and people, if they are really bad people, um, so he explained to us that we are losers and we don't understand uh, the biology of uh, human brain aging and that when you get the biopsy from the brain, it's already dead, right? And before that, it was dying for a while. So you need to, if you want to make this uh, data sets a little bit more compatible, you need to actually remove some pathways that uh, pop up because the brain is dying. So you need to try to get to the disease um, pathway, so we used his advice and uh, deep bow to you, Jeffrey. Um, uh, we ran those uh, data, data sets from both uh, um, iPSC derived uh, neurons and ALS uh, uh, primary through pandaonics, found some new targets, and also some of those targets had drugs for repurposing, and we tested that in, uh, in flies. So that was the experimental design. Uh, so here, and you can read the paper uh, in Frontiers of Aging Neuroscience, so we published it pretty quickly. We wanted a quick paper, um, otherwise we could have gone for a bigger journal, uh, but it's good enough. Uh, and um, also all the screencasts are available for target ID are available at ls.ai. Uh, and we tested those 26 targets that we predicted uh, in the fly model. So here we've got uh, rescue and um, actually enhanced <laughs> uh, disease phenotype. Uh, so out of uh, those 26, 21 worked well, and some worked very strongly. So you can actually see that uh, number of genes that we predicted to work. So some demonstrated strong rescue, nine, mo moderate rescue, nine, uh, no effect, four, and two enhanced the disease phenotype. That is actually pretty cool when drug discovery and preclinical drug discovery, right? So it means that you have narrowed down your search um, and we published this paper, and based on this work, um, uh, Lubai's com uh, company for biotechnology is out of Tsinghua University. If you have not heard about, how many of you have not heard about Tsinghua University? Great. Oh, you have, ah, okay, no, 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 I'm just saying who have not heard about Tsinghua. Yeah, so if you have not, you know, by the way, guys, my advice to everybody, next trip you make anywhere, go to China because every time I spend, go, go there and spend a little bit of time, it's like eye-opening experience because you actually don't want to sleep because things are happening in real time. The skyscrapers are being built, electric cars on the streets, robots on the streets, 
um, everything digital, they don't use cash, uh, and papers are being published every, uh, all the time. Government officials have PhDs, uh, so when they talk to you, the mayor can come to you to see your lab and they would actually talk your language. You're like, oh! Um, that's pretty cool. So they are all about science. Uh, and uh, 4B Technologies recruited 60 patients in a clinical trial now. So from the time we did the target ID to human clinical trial, less than a year. Pretty cool, right? How many of you have done that? I have never done that. Uh, the company that I know is going after LS also uh, in um, AI powered drug discovery, they went after a pretty known target, uh, PIC5. Uh, it took them four and a half years, and they say it's a record. All right, so boom. Uh, this is a repurposing exercise, though. So when you are trying to do your own uh, drug discovery with your own chemistry, it will take you longer, significantly longer. Uh, and now, we have the first case in fibrosis where we have identified new targets, generated new chemistry, did our own synthetic ret uh, uh, retrosynthesis planning, completed more than 120 experiments, uh, took the drug into phase zero of human clinical trials in Australia, and then completed uh, phase one in um, New Zealand, and in parallel, another one in China. So in total, for the safety study, I used uh, uh, 123 patients, um, 80 patients in New Zealand, which is pretty cool, right? And now it's going phase two. So, you know, fingers crossed, that's gonna be our ultimate test. But if we fail, we've got a bunch of other programs, right? Um, and also, we decided to purpose towards idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. So the way I identified this target, I used um, age predictors. Deep, 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 deep learning system that predicts age uh, on multiple tissues, and then we retrain on fibrosis, so transfer learning, and show you how we do it, if you like. But then we used pandaomics to prioritize targets, uh, identified 20 targets, we could test only five because of the availability of experimental uh, models, and also it was early days, 2019. Um, prioritized one, and took it into fibrosis because it was also implicated in fibrosis, dual purpose target. But when I show it to pharma, no talk about aging. So the reason why we choose this target is because it's important in many patients. It doesn't come up as, let's say, number one, number two, number three in every fibrosis uh, uh, profile, patient profile, but it's in top 100, usually. Uh, and it's also in uh, uh, top 100 in aging. So we, and it worked in every disease model we ever tested it in. It's YAPTAS pathway, uh, TGF beta and WIMP. So master regulator of several of those. Um, uh, very no well known fibrotic pathways. Uh, and of course you want to go after a big disease like NASH or kidney fibrosis where you know this one is more than 15% of the global population, right? But to do that, you need to conduct a huge clinical study. So you would need to have a lot of patients and uh, to avoid that, you purpose towards a smaller disease like idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, also age-related. So the average age of onset is, you know, 60. And uh, you want to demonstrate the effect in both aging and disease. So, you know, as they say in the Middle East, inshallah now. Um, and uh, we also went after other targets. So then we went after something that is more well-known, so PHG2. That's CIF1 alpha, that one should be a killer in aging, right? So that's your new tool, 100%, and then not 100%, 90%, uh, according to me. Um, and uh, there are several other AI companies that are focused on aging research. How many of you know BioAge? Great, so by the way, great business model, great company, great to CEO, something to replicate, uh, and um, what they do, they look, use longitudinal data sets and then find drugs to repurpose. Uh, and they buy at phase one from pharma companies that already have chemistry and that have proven safety. And then they do phase two clinical trials in a disease uh, and then also run aging biomarkers to see if it works. This is actually the fastest way. Then you don't, screw, don't get stuck in chemistry. Sometimes chemistry is a huge problem, right? I, I've seen it many times, especially when you're going novel. Um, 
and they also have PSD2, they also have PFON alpha. I think I saw one slide where Calico was also go, uh, had PFON alpha pretty high up on their list when they did their uh, age prediction uh, exercise using uh, GBM, uh, uh, gradient boosting um, machine. Um, and uh, we decided to use PSD2 uh, as one of our targets. Uh, there were a few failures in phase three for safety with PSD2. So it upregulates PIPA, erythropoietin. And that's why a lot of, uh, like it's a very clear cut uh, path to anemia. It's a huge disease, right? So everybody has anemia. Uh, and if you have a marketed product for anemia, you are going to address aging and you are gonna address a big disease and make a lot of money. So, but so far everything failed in anemia uh, except for some clinical trials in Asia where they did not look at safety as in the same way US did. So we decided to create a gut-restricted molecule uh, that upregulates uh, some barrier repair genes, but the molecule does not go into the bloodstream. Uh, so using generative chemistry, and now achieved preclinical candidate in both anemia and uh, I, uh, and IBD. So hopefully we'll start human clinical trials. But since the target is not new, pharma companies like it. And also, if you demonstrate efficacy in phase two and uh, safety you might be able to actually even sell it in the Asian countries that uh, um, allow you to have a certain safety profile and still make a lot of money, right? And be able to test it with aging costs later on. So QPCTL, I've talked about this target. Uh, we also went after COVID. So same target as uh, uh, Pfizer decided to use, right? But they took an, an ancient uh, compound from the library from uh, 2003 screening for MERS, uh, SARS. Um, so we decided to build a new no novel molecule and now it's in phase one human clinical trial in China. USP1, how many of you know David Sabatini? Huh? MIT. MIT, X, MIT. Uh, so yeah, he got ousted out of Whitehead uh, and uh, uh, MIT, I'm not gonna comment on why, um, but uh, he is brilliant mind in biology. Uh, I think H index 148 or something like that. Last year he published uh, 12 uh, nature and science papers after being ousted. <laughs> um, so pretty, pretty cool. And that's his company. So his company, TSQ Therapeutics, identified USP1 as a synthetic lethality target, but it's also dual purpose. It's also, I think, implicated on aging pretty strongly. Uh, and TSQ is actually ahead of us uh, several months. Um, and we decided to do a fast follower uh, with that to become best in class, also in synthetic lethality, uh, but also age associated. Um, and many others are just uh, cancer targets uh, with possible dual purpose, uh, but they are made for sale because you need to live on something, right? And you need to constantly sell assets, sell those cookies to pharma in order to bankroll your business. And um, that's why we sometimes go after targets like EMPP1 or the GTA uh, that might not have direct uh, evidence of being involved, implicated in aging. And recent papers also suggest that MAP2A inhibition promotes muscle, muscle growth in mice, which was pretty cool. Uh, even though it's uh, synthetic lethality targets uh, inhibiting methyltransferase. Um, but yeah, we've got a pretty good pipeline, so now Keyword, so we nominated nine preclinical candidates last year. So big pharmaceutical companies on average nominate four to five. So let it sink in. So now I have to sell those cookies very quickly. Um, but uh, yeah, we basically outperform many big pharmas in terms of internal, internal R&D. Uh, and usually our level of quality is higher than big pharma because we go after several CROs and uh, very often we repeat the experiments in different CROs. If something succeeds or fails, we, we, we may make them redo it and get the third one to redo it as well. That's why also human clinical trials, we try to run them in parallel in China and the US uh, in, um, or, or, or other Western countries um, with sometimes slightly different clinical study design to get more data and get more confidence and more evidence that the product is safe and effective. So now I'm gonna skip a few slides. So since we know that RAI can churn out really valuable targets, 
we thought about how to, how to automate it. How many of you are familiar with my Sujo lab? Have you seen the videos? Yeah? Okay, one, great. So, um, and how many of you are familiar with uh, a broad, uh, broad institute um, C map, uh, connectivity map? Nobody is using it? Okay, one, two. Uh, or Lynx project L1000, uh, the transcriptional response measure it for 1,000 1, uh, landmark genes and cancer. So many cell lines incubated with different compounds and expression was measured, right? Great, great tool, everybody's training on that, but it's also pretty old. So we thought, okay, great inspiration. So we've got a lot of this data and a lot of our own data. So why don't we try to automate the creation of something similar, but getting not only expression of landmark genes, but entire RNA-seq plus methylation plus deep phenotyping. So you could, in theory, after a certain time, infer um, uh, from imaging the expression methylation. You know, again, this is, say, in the Middle East, inshallah. Um, and for that, I actually decided to build a fully automated robotics lab to help us with target discovery predominantly, uh, target validation, and also personalized medicine. And uh, uh, now we actually built this lab and we're expanding it. I call it Life Star One because it's the opposite of Death Star. Um, I got a lot of inspiration from Star Wars. I'll show you why. Uh, and I'm trying to build a hospital side lab. So try to miniaturize it, right? So now it's running 24 seven as holidays in China. My people still live there. So there you have slightly different work ethic, right? So uh, they know that uh, organoids do not sleep and do not go on vacation. So some people for, have foregone their May holidays and actually uh, stayed in the lab. Believe it or not, once one big pharma company sent us to their own compliance because they thought that our people work too hard. That was like a few years ago. Um, seriously, uh, that was like really dramatic. Delayed our program by six, 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 six months, right? And we tried to explain that we're not forcing people to do anything, right? Um, but now my goal is to uh, make those hospital side labs in the next, next, next couple of years and try to discover targets at hospital premises. So maybe we'll be able to sell those um, labs to hospitals in the countries that have never aspired to do drug discovery. So currently, you know, probably 20% of the global targets are being discovered at the city of Basel in Switzerland because there you've got Roche and Novartis and you've got a lot of culture uh, for target discovery. And um, now I'm gonna show you a quick video how we built our lab in uh, uh, Suzhou. So this is my site in Shanghai. We have a pretty epic uh, place in Changtang Plaza in Zhangjiang, that's like Silicon Valley in Shanghai. We've got pretty nice kind of in silico style everything. We have an entire floor. This is Dr. Ren, my co-CEO. Uh, we've got the dry lab there where people are um, uh, working on supervising the CROs and managing the uh, program. Uh, one and a half hours drive from Shanghai is Suzhou, wonderful city, extremely wealthy, extremely knowledgeable, 30 minutes uh, by train. So this is last April, exactly one year ago when everybody was quarantined uh, with COVID, right? I probably remember, so I got this wonderful building uh, and uh, we got at it. Uh, by the way, this is the In Silico Docuthon, documentary hackathon. That's why I've got this video. <laughs> so people are shooting, right? And I'm promising to build the lab. Um, and uh, people worked round the clock. Sometimes they were quarantined there. We got some government permission to work. So even though, you know, gas leaks and they still work. That's me sleeping there. Uh, this is today. So I wanted it to be, to look like, you know, uh, Star Wars. So it's face activated uh, entrance. So you walk in, it recognizes you, opens up. Here you've got um, uh, dimmed windows. So you can see through them and uh, you can undim them and see through, uh, through them if it's not uh, something confidential. Only three rooms are vis visible out of six. We've got also pretty good uh, presentation area. That's real footage, not animation. Uh, and uh, I've got miniature copies of every room uh, for what we can show. 29th of December, four months ago, I opened it. A lot of people traveled there, even though it was an outbreak of COVID pandemic. You probably remember everybody was coughing their lungs out, including me. Um, I cannot confirm or deny if I used uh, anesthesia-like protease inhibitors. 
um, and this is actually very senior to show. It's re real, um, uh, real footage from my lab. So you take tissues or cells, uh, give it to the robot. The robot picks it up, does uh, grinds it, does quality control. So no mycoplasma, no fungus. Uh, gives it to a different room. There we have our own autonomous guided vehicle that we've engineered, self-learning. One cost like Tesla Model 3, but you can cost it down to 5K. Uh, you give it to an imaging station. There you get uh, Celigos, you've got CX-7, so fluorescence, deep phenotyping. Um, part of the sample gets destroyed, part is going to the incubator. Then this is the NGS prep room. So we've got uh, whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing. Uh, library prep, uh, uh, RNA-seq, and also uh, methylation. So you know methylation aging clocks and transcriptomic aging clocks. Transcriptomic aging clocks have got a granted patent. So you can actually do aging clocks from the same sample, well, many, many, many. Uh, and um, so imaging methylation transcriptomics. We've got an Illumina uh, machine that generates methylation transcriptomics uh, and whole exome. It goes into my AI layer that is already trained on you know, global pharma. For targets that we pick up automatically, uh, for compounds that already we are known to work or are true compounds for those targets, we pick them from the compound hotel, uncap them, put them on a liquid handler, uh, do some quality control. We also have uh, echoes uh, where we can uh, do even more uh, um, uh, analysis of the compounds, uh, this typical echo machine. Um, and uh, uh, we prepare those uh, compounds for transfer onto the cells that are being uh, grown in the incubator or uh, tissue samples that we've collected. Um, then we uh, aliquot and put them back in the incubator for six hours, 24 hours, 70, uh, 48 hours, 72 hours, depending on what we want to do. Uh, and it's also very compatible with broad. Uh, and then you complete the entire circle again. So you get deep phenotyping, so transcription response, deep phenotyping response, and uh, methylation response, uh, and for something interesting, so whenever uh, AI makes a good target choice, it gets rewarded, and we also see which uh, um, philosophy worked, uh, and if it uh, does badly, it gets punished, and we also see which philosophy did not work. Um, even though we are currently constrained to the, well, to the targets that have uh, known compounds in this workflow, we also have a CRISPR station there, uh, and single cell machine, currently not uh, in operation, will be operational in the next few weeks. Um, but then if you find something interesting, I've got a pretty substantial human lab where they prosecute some of those target hypotheses. Uh, currently we're working predominantly with cancer because cancer is more stable, but the lab is capable of doing uh, cardio, so we can do be beating hearts, and hopefully the brain. Um, so, and since we have pretty advanced imaging technology and some of the workflows end there because uh, anything omics is very expensive. It, well, we managed to make it much less expensive. We have our own protocol with Shanghai Jiao Tong University uh, that makes methylation a breeze. Um, so very cheap uh, and um, still uh, enough resolution uh, for deep neural networks. Uh, and, um, we generate a lot of data, so it works 24 seven and we currently process a lot of cancer and train AI, but also we found a few really interesting targets using this. So again, wanted to invite you to, uh, to our conference. I know I'm out of time, uh, right now, no. So, uh, oh, if you want to learn a little bit more about longevity, you can go to longevity.degree. We have several um, courses that are CME accredited and are used on uh, HDR UK and NHS platforms to upskill physicians. This is physician focused uh, course series, free. Um, so I found it myself. Uh, and there is a really cool uh, biomarker consortium, aging biomarker consortium predominantly led by Vadim Gladyshev out of Harvard, uh, but also the Buck Institute. Uh, I'm an adjunct faculty uh, at the Buck. Uh, and um, uh, they are trying to identify which clocks could be used for what purpose and come up with an uh, aging clock consensus. But if you have not seen this paper, download it now. Because this comes out of China. It's called the Biomarkers of Aging. One of the best works on aging biomarkers I've ever seen a review. They even cited 14 of my papers. I was like, damn, how? Most people don't even, you know, they intentionally forget, or they sometimes forget. These guys did not forget, and I did not review this. It's in uh, uh, the local uh, 
journal, uh, and the only uh, papers that were cited uh, more times, I think 15 papers from Horvath. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and they, can, can they came, came up with this kind of uh, scheme uh, where they're going all the way from um, uh, you know, serviceable, systemic, specific biomarkers. Uh, uh, they look at different uh, uh, molecular representations, uh, biomarkers of organ aging, um, different dimensions, so systemic aging, so great work. And what I can tell you is that when China does something and they just started, usually you have to be there and you have to ride the wave because it's going to be massive. So if some of you are not doing aging research, go into aging research, uh, collaborate with those guys. These guys are not exactly super collaborative with foreigners yet, I already tested, uh, but um, uh, I'm sure they will. Uh, and, um, but here I've got the entire who is who. Uh, and uh, uh, I hope to see some of them at the ARD this year. So now don't take pictures, it's unpublished. I'm gonna tell you about some fun stories. Um, so uh, maybe some of you, how many of you went to GRC last year? Gordon Richards con conference on aging. This year, yeah, uh, next year. But it's not Horvath and Gladyshev, right? It's somebody else. Oh, okay. So that's a slightly different one. This is uh, uh, th th this is systems aging, Gladyshev and Horvath, uh, mostly on biomarkers. It's every two years. Uh, that's why I was like shocked. Sorry. So, but last year I presented one really cool thing. So, how many of you know this paper? Yeah, that comes out of DeepMind. Uh, 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 Freitas, uh, professor at Oxford, but also DeepMind. And you know, when I first saw it, I was shocked. So that's me uh, at the GRC, right, presenting it. Um, but this paper, look it up, it's the multimodal transformer. That was published uh, in, I think, April, uh, April 2022, before GP chat GPT became popular. So they managed to train a deep neural network, well, one large language model, one transformer-based large language model to do many tasks at the same time. So uh, fold proteins, uh, recognize pictures, uh, produce valuable text. So one ring to rule them all. Uh, unfortunately, they did use very few parameters and it's not industrial strength like open AI, right? And I didn't use reinforcement learning with human feedback to make it charitable but that showed you already the power of multimodal. So this is the slide I presented at uh, GRC. I said, guys, let's just build a massive multimodal transformer that will integrate many aging clocks at the same time. Because it's like the first and the easiest applications of transformers in biotech, boom, right? Train tokenized transcriptomics and methylation and a few other data types and get really good uh, prediction of age, but also generate synthetic biological data using age as a generation condition. Boom. So now we just did this. It was accepted uh, with minor revision last week, uh, but after four months in review, review in a reasonably easy journal, um, still got a lot of comments. So there we use expression methylation and metadata um, to build uh, two transformers. So two multimodal transformers on aging and disease. And then we did transfer of weights uh, from aging to disease study uh, and try to identify protein targets that are implicated in aging and disease at the same time. Oh, don't, don't, don't take pictures. It's not published yet, please. <laughs> uh, yeah. Or you know what? Take a picture, but don't post it. <laughs> Um, so in this, uh, it's a teaser for the paper, right? It's currently, uh, it will be published. Uh, but there we use uh, tissue age and sex as major annotation, right, for the, for the model. Uh, and uh, identify uh, most important genes implicated in aging and disease, run them through Panda omics, and come up with dual purpose targets out of a transformer model. So now we don't need to, you know, go after uh, many, many, many different uh, target ID exercises to go after just one model, one multimodal transformer. By the way, accuracy is crap. 
but whereas many are you know, so com compared to you know standard best in class so for methylations this one model does four years right so current best in class is what 2.7 2 uh, you can see my paper called deep mage uh, with its 2.6 something uh, mean absolute error on uh, uh, tens of thousands um, expression 6.2 my best expression, uh, deep neural net, does 4.5. Uh, combined 5.6, but also with metadata. But the beauty of this is that it's one model for both, right? For, for well, three, three data types. And you can query it for targets. Never been done before. So that's pretty cool. And we come up with some not novel targets that are implicated in, uh, uh, in this case, in. Um, Stratopulmonary disease, uh, COPD, uh, and aging at the same time, not novel targets, and found some really promising ones that are gonna be in this paper. So uh, apelin, for example, receptor uh, implicated on both aging clock and aging out of transformer. Um, uh, so uh, in both cardiovascular and cognitive diseases, maybe something more interesting to you know, try out. Uh, does it pop up? in any of the studies. Um, and uh, uh, IL-23R, um, uh, so interleukin receptor, uh, also was um, implicated in aging and disease. So here I'd like to uh, pause, but please wait for this paper. When it comes out, please do tweet it because it's gonna be pretty cool. And we have fast follow-on where we uh, use a transformer, a bigger one, uh, for the generation of um, synthetic biological data with age as a generation condition. That one we probably will just publish. Uh, and we're trying to combine mouse and men, mouse and humans. That would be really cool. So now I'll pause here. Um, yeah. Been here, uh, if you raise your hand, so uh, he's kind of the finance guy, so he's the CFO <laughs> of the, the thing. So I want to ask before the you know uh, research question come in, kind of, uh, in a more entrepreneurial angle and start up, and how did you raise so much funds, and <laughs> is it still not enough, and how much do you, more do you think you will need, and can you give like some tip to you know the uh, aspiring entrepreneurs, scientists here, uh, for let's say even going, how how do you go to? Uh, Middle East and raise uh, money there. So, uh, sure. Middle East, very little money, by the way, so right. far. Right. Um, but you so I hope that, uh, I, I have one. Okay. Uh, we have two, right? So um, that's a very good question. So originally, it was very difficult for me to raise funding, right? So if you look at my bio, I'm not exactly the uh, high profile biotech entrepreneur that uh, biotech funds give money to from right away. So I made a lot of money in semiconductors early in the days uh, and founded the company myself originally. And then we also got some funding from uh, a company called Deep Knowledge Ventures, a tiny, tiny amount, uh, but they were, we, we, we convinced them uh, and actually helped them kind of grow a little bit. So I have to acknowledge that, uh, but it was, uh, you know, $1 million. Um, and uh, then that funding also was not given to us right away. It was very difficult to get uh, over time. And then uh, we demonstrated that some of this technology can work. And then Jim Mellon from Juvenescence invested a little bit. So how many of you know Jim Mellon? Yeah, not a bad person to come for money in aging, right? Because he wrote a book on uh, investing in longevity and um, famous British billionaire, um, but he also knows a little bit about biotech. He invested in early stages in Medivation, I think it's $14 billion exit into Pfizer. Mm -hmm. And then in front of me, he invested pretty much seed at a company called Biohaven, another $11 billion exit into Pfizer mm -hmm. uh, with migraine drugs. And it's like super not novel, right? So, but I saw it in front of my eyes. Um, and now he has a company called Juvenescence, which is an aging research company 
uh, doing clinical trials, doing something similar to what BioAge is doing, but mostly using human intelligence for picking the targets and the compounds. Uh, and um, they invested a little bit, so they gave us basically a year worth of money, so we raised five million. Uh, but once you start doing your own discovery or your large scale software development using AI, that were, those were like 2016 days, right? Um, back then, deep learning scientists were extremely expensive. So they were like football players. And so I had to go to Russia and Ukraine to create great big competitions where thousands of people competed. And then, you know, I tried to recruit top two, top three, some of them still work for the company and now they're in the Middle East. Um, and um, we were burning quite a bit of cash just on software. And we also couldn't convince pharma that it works because pharma started giving you pilots. Mm -hmm. By the way, never agree to a pilot unless you know that the people, person who is going to work with you is going to be with the company for many years. Mm -hmm. I have a slide deck on that, by the way on how to build biotechnology enterprise by avoiding pilots. Mm -hmm. So it's much better, I, I have it in front of me. Um, and very often pharma makes extremely stupid decisions that, are, that have nothing to do with getting drugs to the patient, mm -hmm. right? And I can tell it to you, I, like last couple of weeks, we had a really fun case. Uh, sorry, I drifted from the question. Uh, but it's kind of pressing, but uh, very interesting as well. So one big pharma, decided to go after three companies in our field, uh, really top, right, so at the very top, to engage them in early stage R&D to boost their R&D performance. And they uh, asked us, okay, which targets can you work on and which ones you can't, right? Which ones do you have in your own internal pipeline? Uh, and they want to go up to 10 targets, right, with a partner. So we say, okay, here is our list. And they come back to us and say, oh, out of the, so out of the top 10 that we want to ch challenge the company for, eight overlap with your pipeline. Mm -hmm. So we're like, yes, it means that we already have starting points, right? So heat to lead. So a sane scientific um, uh, research officer, uh, uh, chief science officer would always take us, right? Because they can pay us a little bit more money, but they will be two years ahead and the probability of success would be pretty much guaranteed in at least some of them, right? Because we are at heat to lead or preclinical candidate. That's how we did the Fosun deal, now going phase one, right? Um, guess what? After some deliberation, for, uh, thanks God it was short and didn't waste a lot of our time, they're saying, sorry, we decided to choose somebody else because we want to start from scratch to see if AI works or not. You know what it means? Three things. First, they missed the chance to be first to patient with the right drugs. Second, um, most likely it will be a pilot where, yes, the company is going to get a little bit of money up front, but it's not going to be a lot, right? Uh, third, most likely the internal IT team is also going to try to steal as much of uh, information as possible, right? And try to quote, quote unquote learnings, right? Do learning. Four, they won't learn anything because technology changes much, much faster than it takes to discover a drug, right? And fifth, most likely the CSO will not see the fruits of this research in the clinic mm -hmm. because something is gonna go wrong, right? I mean, uh, AstraZeneca announced a partnership on target discovery for IPF and uh, uh, and, and, and I think CKD, so chronic kidney disease, just same thing that I have in my pipeline, right? 2019 in April, they announced a partnership with Benevolent AI. Mm. Guess what, right now it's early stage chemistry, right, officially on the, pub, on, on the, on the, on the, on the website, right? And uh, guess what, it's four years. Right now I am already in you know, phase one complete with my own novel chemistry and uh, new target for the same indications. So usually it's much slower with pharma, for sure. Always, uh, but sometimes they make those kind of stupid decisions. And that happened to us after Jim Mellon invested. So I'll give you another example yeah. uh, because it relates to fundraising. So 2015 to 2018, we started collaborating with GSK massively, right? So many, many, many different projects. Uh, at that time they were exploring. Sometimes we did something what I call slave labor when you come to them and say, okay, well, what, uh, what, what, can you, what are you doing, right? Maybe we can uh, help you do it a little bit better for very cheaply or free. 
right? But then you learn in terms of what works and what doesn't, not necessarily getting their data. So then 2017, we announced the partnership, right? And there it was pretty sizable for drug discovery end to end. Uh, at that time, John Baldoni, remember this name? He was the head of platforms, basically thousands of people reporting to him, all internal R&D. Um, and uh, we, we were about to do an end-to-end -end drug discovery deal. That's 2017 also led to some investments, right? So people, investors were about to give us a lot of money mm -hmm. uh, because we had that deal, right? And we've proven, <coughs> if I get, uh, we've proven ourselves in that deal. And um, uh, we, got the, um, we got the green light. And guess what, Hal Barron, one of the founders of Calico, joins GSK and he owns most of the internal projects that did not comply with their target, with his target philosophy. Internal as well and ours also. John Baldoni gets uh, retired and guess what? Goes to form uh, a company with flagship pioneering called Integral Therapeutics, which became Valo, which got a lot of money uh, and started competing with us a little bit. Um, and then a lot of other people left and our project got terminated 2018, right, officially. So that led to an event which, in theory, would have killed us, right? So Hal Baron would have killed us. Um, now he is, by the way, went just a few months ago, he went to Altos, mm -hmm. an anti-aging company, right? So Calico, then GSK, and then Altos. And by the way, GSK was the largest uh, vaccine producer and the va largest antiviral maker. I mean, they make those, I think Tamiflu is theirs, right? Uh, Tamiflu or Lenza. Uh, one of them, right? So they are like big, big antiviral player. Guess what? COVID goes, no drug, no, no vaccine, right? Mm -hmm. Pfizer does the drug and vaccine and they never, you know, they, they are not exactly a vaccine or um, uh, antiviral player. So I'm not gonna comment on his performance at GSK in terms of R&D, um, but uh, he definitely killed us mm -hmm. and we would have died yeah. if uh, we, were, we would not be lucky enough to have our generative chemistry work experimentally at Wuxi Aptek. Mm -hmm. And at that time they gave us, uh, supported us with round A very quickly. And after that, so after you got Wuxi, the chemistry CRO, uh, putting you know, a tiny amount, $2 million, uh, but they brought in government of Singapore, so for, for pavilion capital, one of the super, in, uh, super important investors, healthcare investors out of Tomasic, and also bold capital, Peter Diamandis. Okay. So together the round was six million uh, and um, we survived and thrived, right? But after that, we never had to think about fundraising because those huge investors uh, with experimental validation, um, they basically tell everybody, okay, well, technology works here and here and here, here it's fresh. Mm -hmm. And uh, the investor world, everybody talks, we were always subscribed every round. Right, and then we got uh, big names like uh, Chi Ming, mm -hmm. uh, and then we got big names like uh, uh, Warburg Pincus. They did a round C, they're a large shareholder, so big, big investor globally. And then BCG, so uh, Bo uh, Boston Consulting Group's B Capital, uh, that's the round D. And then we got a small, tiny top up from Aramco, the largest company in the world, um, or second largest, but it's a small investment comparatively. Uh, but we also trained our algorithms to redesign their petrochemistry. Mm. So materials, longevity. So actually you can do uh, all kinds of petrochemical derived materials yeah. that can either degrade quickly or, uh, or last longer. They didn't try to get you to uh, uh, Saudi Arabia? No, but I like to go there. By the way, Saudi <laughs> is another place, guys. You know, I'm telling everybody to go to China. First go to China. I mean, there's a future, that's the future of the world. If you've got kids, teach them Chinese. If they don't want to speak Chinese, they will get Neuralink one day. It's better to do it without Neuralink. <laughs> but uh, you know, whatever you think, whatever uh, the current tensions are, China is going to be number one. Uh, and it is better to be friends rather than fight. Um, and we did not take a lot of money from China, but uh, I can tell you that we rely very heavily on the infrastructure there. Uh, that gives us probably one or two years advantage when it comes to our program discovery development. Also different work ethic, right? So there people really work. Um, and um, 
if you want to explore the next big thing, go to Saudi. Because when I went to Saudi for the first time, I thought everybody is wearing burqas, right? And there was a religious police, and they are like discriminated everywhere. And you know, we've got somebody who might have been implicated in some public um, uh, debacle um, in Turkey, right? Uh, and uh, consolidated the power. And I go there and I realize everybody is extremely optimistic, no more religious police. So since uh, His Royal Highness MBS uh, um, Crown Prince uh, took the power, he disbanded the religious police. And yes, he had to do some you know, uh, rough moves to ensure that this religious police does not go after him, right? So, and also the local population, you cannot really quickly do the reform, right? So reforms don't happen all the time. So he decided to build those mega projects like Neom, this huge city, real thing by the way. Who knows if they're gonna finish or not, but it's a real thing. He basically is trying to build pyramids so that people try to get out of their mindset where they were, you know, control, control. I, I go there, I talk to some bankers, European bankers, and they're telling me, look Alex, seven years ago, during uh, prayer time, if you are in a shopping mall, you're gonna get hit with a stick. And they can hit you for you know showing part of your body. Mm. Right now, you still probably would not wear a miniskirt there, uh, but you can. Uh, people will probably not, they will be surprised. Yeah, it's the same thing um, well, but, uh, and I, des I designed my own um, twab, uh, my own kandura. Uh, within Silico logo, a zipper is everywhere, so yeah. personal area network. By the way, it works amazingly because you can put so much electronics into this thing, so you don't need a backpack anymore. Um, uh, and um, with a logo, so at every, every conference, everybody is normal with a suit and you're in this thing, uh, and uh, you stand out. Um, so Saudi is a great place to go to visit, to see this new revived spirit. So now everybody, a taxi driver there would tell you that, look, I am extremely optimistic. I want to stop taxi driving. I want to go to Neon to work because, you know, the country is doing something great. So they have a vision. And 2.5% of the local GDP is now focused on sustainable energy. So they are like all about sustainability. And I think half of that is going into aging research. So they have a fund called Keyvolution. We have not tapped into that, and I'm not sure how real it is. I know everybody there. I'm talking about real in terms of, you know, if I were, if I had two brain cells and I had a billion dollars to spend, that's the budget they have every year, I would say, hey, Alex, why don't you build a lab here, right? Or let's discover some dual purpose therapeutics and in three years, you're gonna have a preclinical candidate ready for clinical trial. So, but they haven't done that. Uh, and so far I haven't seen any investments, but they started, distributing most of this money to US academics. And I'm pretty sure at UK as well, so you can actually apply for grants. But then you start uh, uh, a startup and apply through that. Yeah, so cost you 300 bucks to register and you still have your academic affiliation. Uh, I, had, I have not explored the trout, I'm not sure if it's legal, but impetus grants and other, I think APAR may allow you to do that. Um, I don't know, I have not tried it because it would be like very small grants currently. Yeah, yeah but I'm saying that this is, you know, the future and the future is now. And China just recently brokered a peace deal between Saudi and Iran, mm. which probably will be a huge thing. I mean, they should be getting a Nobel Prize for that because Otherwise, these guys probably would go, have gone to war, right? And possibly nuclear. Um, and uh, uh, we think that uh, that region is really interesting and is good to go to. By the way, there is a great app that they have. It's called AppShare. I, I do not have that. But this app controls, you can control everything in your life with this app. You can complain to the government. Uh, if you are a woman and somebody kind of mistreated you, you can report immediately, right? Uh, and then somebody who did this is going to get into big trouble, maybe very big trouble, 
I love the, uh, love you will never see that person again. I think it's developing and, and they're definitely yeah. buying, you know, technologies in order to, to be more sustainable with yeah. the, uh, with the, you know, uh, economy. So, uh, Brendan, we have more time to for questions. Yes, uh, one more. So I have one more question and then one more comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Decided to choose somebody else to yeah, see it all the for the entire process. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that uh, there's so many things that you have to think about when you're doing this job. Of course, of course. So for us, we never have hard feelings. Okay. You know, even like if Hal Baron one day calls and says, "Look, Alex, you know what? I have trouble with Altos. We need to have uh, uh, chemical reprogramming and." I need your lab. I say, no problem. Here are the keys. Let's go. Um, because in this industry and in this life, uh, there should not be any hard feelings. Uh, and I see that those hard feelings propagate also into politics very often, right? So, for example, you know, things happened in China before or in Saudi that are not nice, right? But people still think that they are happening now. Uh, and that's not true. So, maybe, so pharma also changes in the same way. So sometimes they do extremely bad things uh, and very illo uh, irrational, not logical, but very often they do great things. And you want to ensure that you get them to the right timing when they do great things. Oh, Chinese are not open-minded when it comes to aging. So they were at, uh, uh, I think it's called Changshou Longevity. Changshou? Changshou? Changshou Longevity. How do you say longevity? <laughs> See, like a little bit of differentiation, right? And that's it. So that's the problem. Uh, I will need Neuralink. AI is going to help. Yeah, you can, you but just go to Middle East and then so in, in the China, future. Yeah, in China, if, if it's... Chang mm, Yeah. <laughs> okay. See if Chang then it works, but Chang doesn't work. <laughs> uh, so uh, everybody who is um, into longevity, they are automatically not credible. So you are going to be in the rank of uh, Chinese traditional medicine, which people like and take, and does not require clinical trial. Well, major cl clinical trials. But at the same time, people in credible scientific circles, they will not give you the money yet. Maybe after this aging biomarker consortium and a big national initiative, it will change. But China, I would say, in aging for drug discovery, even more conservative than the States, by far. Uh, Saudis are extremely ambitious, but they have never discovered a drug in their life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't know how to do that. And the person who is running this evolution he was the chief science officer of PepsiCo, uh, equals diplomat, right? So you are trying to sell sugar water globally and try to tell people that it's scientific, right? Um, so um, in uh, the US, currently a lot of farmers are looking at the possibility of using aging research to go after neuro, for example. Now neuro is a becoming a thing, again, because the FDA gave some approval just to prove the point that now it's again sexy. So people should get, get money, right, and sh from VC money, because everything else before it failed, right? So you don't have to pay out. So after the Biogen approval, we got a few others, and now pharma is starting to look at uh, aging through the prism of neuro. Or fibrosis, or senile fibrosis. So if you demonstrate some basic research um, that shows that some target is implicated in age-associated disease, welcome. But if you show that you are an anti-aging research company, uh, most likely you won't get a meeting at bio. Are you thinking about FDA or the government institutions that actually approve research? Uh, Good question. I think it's just uh, currently they have not been exposed to this much. That's why we uh, created this conference, ARDD. So we try to get more pharma there 
and uh, you know, chairman of Novartis, Jörg Kreinhardt spoke at MIPTEC during this conference uh, in, 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 in Basel. John Manick, who founded Restore Bio, her first talk was at ARDD, and then her last talk was ARDD uh, before the company flopped uh, out of Novartis. Right, so they actually are looking into this, right? But it's a small piecemeal approach. So what we really need is to demonstrate, so if my program one succeeds in phase two, guys, if you know any kind of, if you believe in God, please tell this God that, you know, or multiple gods or whatever you believe in for our program one to succeed in phase two. Uh, because if it does, it will show the precedent and it will set the precedent and we will be able to demonstrate that okay, aging, then I'll be able to release my documentary from the aging perspective. If we fail, we will release this documentary from the pharma perspective um, and explain how, you know, ups and downs. Uh, but if we succeed, it's gonna be great. Same for BioAge. So BioAge therapeutics, we need them to succeed in phase two. They are actually in the public eye, they might look like my competitors, but we are deep, good, good friends, and Christian Swartney uh, used to be a master's student uh, when we first met um, uh, here in the UK, I think it was Bristol. Uh, and um, then she did her PhD at the University of Toronto and the Stanford postdoc and started BioAge. But um, you know, you really need to see a few of those successes because pharma wants to, sh to, to see examples of commercially tractable success. Something that the CEO can experience within their short tenure at the big pharma companies. Because my uh, opinion, one of the reasons, so pharma, how about you, how, how many of you like recycling? Everybody recycles, right? Pharma doesn't recycle. So once Hal Baron came into GSK and killed, you know, 70% of the, 75% of the project, we actually are dead. And if you want to recycle them, as I've explained, after the target has been prosecuted with a small molecule and patents have expired for a good sexy scaffold, it's impossible or very difficult for you to recover it because no venture capitalist will give you a lot of money to prosecute it. So um, uh, pharma is the huge wasteland of uh, amazing, um, amazing ideas, amazing opportunities, uh, including aging research. Um, and they need to see a few commercial successes when they buy the, comp well, the compounds, right? Not the company, I don't think I will sell in silico, but I, will, I can sell my program one for IPF. Uh, and the bigger the deal, the more money they see on the paper, because they like big deals, the more attention you will get to the field. And right now, I actually, I, I, I like to, um, so I don't practice MMA, but I think that MMA is a great sport where you can um, learn a lot in terms of corp corporate culture, corporate philosophy, and how you build your startup. So you need to be good in chemistry, you need to be good in biology, and you need to be able to tell a story. So if you don't know how to promote this work, uh, you or promote your, yourself as a fighter, you know, uh, what is it, you, you see, you, you, you UFC will not notice you and will not take you on the contract, right? Learn from Conor McGregor. The guy was like superstar, right? Billionaire MMA fighter because well, very well rounded. So this is how you need to build your company. And one of the reasons why we are uh, doing some of those documentaries or I started doing a lot of Yuri Color press releases, the conference, uh, this outreach, you know, talking to you guys is because and we even work at high school level right now. So trying to get high school schoolers in this field because you know in five, six years, they're gonna join pharma. To be able to propagate this message that you know aging is the sexiest thing pharma can go after because those targets can be purposed into many diseases and they can actually make a lot of money. That's what pharma is there for. Um, but, you can also create a great story for your ESG compliance thing, right? That you are, uh, you know, transforming the world for the better, not only going after diseases. So it will take time. Uh, so far, aging is a big no-no. And by the way, one other trend I see right now, the rise of 
uh, small and medium type biotechs. So biotechnology companies started delivering, right? So by the way, how many of you have read the book called The Billion Dollar Molecule? Billion Dollar Molecule? Yeah. Read that book. So Billion Dollar Molecule and also a, company, a, a book called Antidote. It's a story of Vertex Pharmaceuticals. Uh, where Vertex was created, became a biotech, and now it's top 10 pharma companies in the world. So you need to create pharma. Maybe one day I will create pharma. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that was wonderful talk. Uh, we now move to you, uh, to Mr. Kamil Kohl, the uh, Director of Bayer, Bayer. And uh, he has uh, had uh, one last minute We have to dress up? No, if you are wearing a uh, gown, if everybody is wearing a gown, so you can wear normal clothes and then have a look. Oh, like Saudi Arabia. Thank you. So I think that I, I think that uh, the Bach Institute has done that already, right? And that's um, yeah, that's Eric Verden's immune clock, right? So yeah, he did. Uh, I don't think it's published. He did a company around that yet. Yeah, uh, ask Eric, actually, so Verdon, because I think they did it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a low-hanging fruit, yeah, or in the United States. Yeah. So they looked at, uh, so let me ex under understand. So we basically take um, T cells, uh, mature, low mature, right, and do expression, or oh, sorry, methylation. Yeah. I think I think it's done, but again, just ask uh, to. If he has done that or not, I think it's happening now. And for, and, for, and, for that, and for that, the funding would be for um, uh, obtaining methylation from the two cells. Yeah. So can you write his name? Eric Verden. Yeah. Oh, I will just uh, so. Yeah, uh, I will, uh, yeah, we'll, 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 we'll,